Well, good morning and welcome to you this morning here at Crossroads Church. It is wonderful to see so many new faces and so many first-time visitors. I'd like to encourage all of our first-time visitors to join us in the lobby afterwards so that we can give you a loaf of Great Harvest Bread. Here at Crossroads Church, we're not only here to nourish the spirit, but the body as well. If you would, please take a moment to stand up and meet and greet those worshiping around you.
Did you feel the mountains tremble? Did you hear the oceans roll? When the people rose to sing of Jesus Christ, the risen one. Did you feel the people tremble? Did you hear the singers roar? When the lost began to sing of Jesus Christ, the saving one. We can see that God's a moving, a mighty river through the nations. Young and old will turn to Jesus. We fling wide.
in a supermarket line and it seems like we we're trying to get through things and get to go to places, we ask that you open the eyes of our heart. Lord, when we are driving and it seems like everything around us is, is zooming by and we're just trying to get where we're going and life's a little too chaotic, you say, open the eyes of our heart, Lord. Lord, when we're at home and we have so much dirty laundry piling up on floors and wet towels on beds and we get frustrated with kids and with parents and one another and siblings, we just say, open the eyes of Lord, it's not only that we want to see you, but we want everybody around us to see you through our actions. Lord, you tell us that we are all part of the body of Christ. This body wouldn't be the same without a toe here, without a finger here, without a thumb here. We need everybody in the body of Christ. And we pray that everybody we come into contact with will see your spirit just emanating and overflowing from us. We truly do want you to fill our cup and let it overflow so much that it can't be missed by everybody around us. Lord, there are too many people in this world who are too frazzled at work from last minute problems and last minute things handed down to them and problems of not getting along with people and just stress all around. But we want to shed all of that because we want to be covered with you. We want to be filled with you, no matter what we are doing, Lord. Whether we're at work or at home, at school, or at play, or hanging out with friends, we don't want it to seem like we're just surviving or getting by. We want to be excited to be children of the King. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Something's up. What's wrong? Well, why do you say that? Well, you didn't say hi like 20 times, and you didn't make me say a word with you. Oh, I'm sorry. Knock it off. You're starting to creep me out. Well, I guess I'm a little down. Why? I don't know. It's probably because I couldn't find my purpose. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I tried to worship. None of the worship ministries, you know, wanted me. Come on, Ron. There are other ways, too. It wasn't them. I tried to fellowship with a small group, and it didn't work out either. Mm, what happened? Well, they voted me out. They said it was a survivor type of thing. Oh, well, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, and then I, I tried a ministry at the hospital, and well, you saw it happen there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, can Mr. Johnson walk again yet? No, but Mrs. Stevens can hold down solid food now. Hey, that's good. Then there's no reason to... And to top it off, I, I had to cancel the ministry I started. Really? They made you cancel it? Yeah, apparently people weren't ready for accidental baptism yet. Well, some of the people did seem pretty upset. Yeah, plus the baptistry it wasn't really built for that kind of wear and tear. Apparently the designers didn't think people would be doing running tackles into the water. Well, you have to admit, that is kind of unusual. Unusual? Hey, that's kind of a fun word. Say it with me. Unusual. Dude, it's not working. Don't try to cheer me up. Okay, Ron. I know it's been hard, but you can't give up. 
Why not? Well, look at how far you've come. You started as a Walmart creator, and you were able to eliminate that as a ministry. Plus, you've eliminated a bunch of other things. There can't be much left. Yeah. I was just thinking back at the old Walmart days. At least I was interacting with people. Yeah. I think I even connected with a few of them. Yeah. I think you go down to aisle C, take a left at the bread, come back by the pieces. Go what? The electronics. You know what? I have an idea. Come with me and I'll see what I can do. Our scripture this morning comes from Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to be reading verses 22 through 24. You were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. New here this morning, you saw that skit from Ron, it maybe didn't make quite as much sense to you. And if you stay for our celebration luncheon, we've actually had a series of five of those dramas on videotape that we've been watching the last five weeks. And so it may put it things in perspective. So if you're a guest here today, I want you to know we have a luncheon following, and you can watch them in sequence. But our discussion has been the last five weeks with Port Ron as he's been trying to find his place. And he's made a lot of mistakes, from throwing people into a baptism tub to um, taking some time to sing in the, the praise team but not doing so well, <laughs> to leading a small group which he could not function very well as a leader in. So it's great to see Ron today finally find his place as the lobby host. So let's thank the technical team and all those who put these dramas together. They did a great job. We're wrapping up our 40 days of purpose by having this awesome celebration Sunday to kind of look back at where we've been. And if you have your program this morning, turn to that center section of your program. There should be a pen maybe in the chair in front of you or somewhere in the aisle. And you can kind of take a few notes and look at how it is exactly we're doing this wrapping up, if you will, the five purposes of a purpose-driven life. The first thing we learned about as we stood out here the first Sunday, and as you read the first chapter of that book, it uses a phrase I love very much. It says, we've learned that it's not all about, that it is all about God and not about us. So many times we think of church, we think of our walk, we always think sometimes about ourselves. And we learn from the study is that it's really not about us. When we come to worship, it's not about getting fed, it's about coming to worship God. We also spent some time learning that, that our life here is preparation for eternity. And if you hear that Sunday, I had Chris, one of our helpers, come up here and he held a, a rope on this end. We put Chris all the way out into the other end of the parking lot. And I held out that rope that went for a couple hundred feet and I said, this much is here on earth. That's how much time we have here. And the rest of it to the other end of the parking lot is eternity. And we get so focused on this much of our life, we forget that we have the rest of eternity that we're preparing for. And that God basically put us here to get ready for that time where we're with Him in fellowship for eternity. There have been two primary scriptures that we've been studying. Along with the Ephesians passage that was just read, these two passages have been kind of the context for our 40 Days of Purpose study. I want you to look at these scriptures and actually have you do something different. I want you to stand up. I want you to read these scriptures along with me. Please stand. The scripture, the first one is called, we call the Great Commandment. This is what they asked Jesus about. Say it with me. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, 
with all your mind and with all your strength. And second is this, to love your neighbor as yourself. The second scripture I want to read along talks about the Great Commission. It's basically what Jesus says to his disciples shortly before entering into heaven. And this is his last challenge for us as a church. Let's read it together. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You may be seated. I want to recap those five principles that we've been talking about for the 40 Days of Purpose. And the first principle that we talked about together a little over 40 days ago was that we were planned for God's pleasure. In other words, when God made us, He made us just like children. And if you've had children around, you know that sometimes they can be frustrating, but they bring such joy. And that's what God has prepared for us, that He's made us so that we could be in relationship with Him. Now, there's a word that we use that's kind of a biblical word about being around God, and we call it worship. Worship. And so our first purpose is worship, but sometimes we formalize worship so much, and we think about sitting in pews and spending an hour here on a Sunday morning. And, and granted, that is worship. We've talked about that. This is kind of a, a community worship, a community time with God. But there are other forms of worship. We talk about private worship, where we have alone time or solitude with God or prayer, and how important prayer is for a Christian. We've discussed Bible study and how you need to study God's Word in private devotion. At our, fa at our um, house, we have a family devotion time, and I just love it because it's kind of family worship. And we spend time doing our highs and lows, and um, one thing we learned that day in a scripture memory verse, and if you go with us to Mission Mexico or any of our mission camp experiences, you get to do those fun things, same things. And I love to watch our kids eat and gobble down their food so they can fight over who's the first one to get to read devotions that night. And I really look forward to every night having that family time to worship God, to have devotion life together. If you look at your program this morning, I have a question for you, kind of two. The first is to kind of think about what's easier for you, public worship coming to this kind of experience or private worship, we have alone time with God or family worship. And in which way do you feel closer to God? And the second thing I want you just to think a little bit about, what are some of those fears you have to completely surrender your life to God? What are those things that hold you back from being in full relationship with God? Take a few, na a few moments and talk with a person next to you. If you're by yourself, like we have somebody down here, why don't you just come and join somebody behind you in a pew next to you and uh, share a couple of thoughts on those questions. Or say, I hate it when Pastor Paul makes me do this. Hopefully the conversations you have, you can finish during our celebration luncheon. We're going to go through a couple of these questions rather ri rapidly today. I want to share a story with you about when I was up at Star Lake Camp. It's a, it's a camp that some of our youth and children have been to, and we're going there again this summer. It's a wonderful place. It's uh, called Star Lake Wilderness Camp. And while I was going to college and seminary, my wife and I, at that time she's my fiance, worked up there. I was a counselor, a maintenance person, and then was the director for over four years. And as I was a part of this camp, I used to see this phenomenon happen. When people would come to the camp, they didn't really think it was going to be a wilderness camp. They somehow saw it in the brochure and saw a beautiful lake. Or it says wilderness, but they didn't really buy into it. Or perhaps some of the kids that were dropped off, I noticed, their parents maybe just wanted to get rid of them for the week and said, <laughs> good luck. And they opened the door and kind of slowed down and shoved them out with their sleeping bag and drove away. And we had all sorts of people come with different frames of reference, shall I say. But this was a, a total wilderness camp. If you've never been there, you pull up and there's just one little building. And this building is where they, they cook the food and prepare it. And there's another little building for staff. But there's really not much else. Everybody lives in the woods. You sleep in a tent. And one of my favorite things is when the parents come in, they go, can I use the restroom? And I say, sure, it's that box right over there. No, not the tool shed. I meant the bathroom. I said, that is the bathroom. So you kind of get a picture of what this place is like. But one of my favorite things is I would always do evaluations at the end of the week. 
And as I'd evaluate the camp, I'd ask, well, what things did you appreciate about it? What things would you change if you could? And I kept notes of some of these because some of them were so wonderfully shared. These were some of the ones that were shared by some of the campers and uh, family campers that attended there. I said, what would make camp more interesting or helpful? One said, escalators would help make it up from the trail from the beach much easier. That would really help your wilderness experience, wouldn't it? One person said, too many rocks on the trail to the teepee. Can they be removed? That stepping around rocks is so difficult. This is one of my favorites. In fact, I, I, I thought maybe we should actually do this one. A McDonald's or fast food restaurant down by the beach. They were thinking, you know, some malts during beach time would be helpful. This is one I think one of my family members wrote. Too many spiders and other bugs. Can we please spray the entire woods? Now this next one just gets me because this was a family camper. They have another part of the camp where you can just come up for a week or a weekend with your, your Winnebago and it's not quite as rustic. So if you, they have an extra shower house and a, a, a toilet there and so forth that you can flush. But this one kind of tickled my, he said, they wrote in their, reimbur or in their um, form, they said, a raccoon ate my pickles. Can I get reimbursed? And this one comes from about 90% of all the young uh, junior high girls. Can the camp please get indoor plumbing? The persons who made these comments, I, I love them dearly, and I think that they are wonderful people in the body of Christ. But what they did not understand was what it's like to be part of a wilderness experience. Now, Missy Gunther, you're smiling over there. Missy used to be one of my campers. Raise your hand. You can stand so they can... She's actually up on, s on the board of directors at Starlight Camp, and we have Dave Hudson, who will be singing music a little bit later. He's the new director for the summer, so you can give him a bad time as well. But if you go to Starlight, you have to understand this is a wilderness camp. Part of what makes it so unique is the fact that you cook over a fire. You sleep in tents. And this is what's expected. And if you come with a different frame of reference that somehow you're going to be getting taken care of, and this is the Holiday Inn with room service and fresh white sheets every day, that's not the camp for you. Now some of you are going, that's the camp I want to go to. Camp Holiday Inn, that's fine. But that's not what Star Lake is about. Now sometimes when we come to church, we have that same expectation that I'm going to get taken care of. That this is Crossroads Holiday Inn. And it's going to be free... Uh, free um, snacks and room service at all times. But the truth is, this is more like Starlight Camp. This is a wilderness experience. It's a challenge course, if you will. And when you come in, we want you as a guest to feel welcome and loved and appreciated. But I also want to be up front. So I'm sharing these five purposes. I'm telling you these things because church is actually an experience that's an adventure. It's like a wilderness camp. You come in and you have wonderful counselors, pastors that help teach you, and bring you along in your faith journey. But we expect things out of you. We want you to be a part of the adventure, not just some type of um, person who stands on the sidelines and watches. You are a participant when you become a Christian. That means it's going to be an adventure. And if you just stay up at the top and just look down, you're not going to experience what God has intended for you. You see, what we were called for, and this is our second point this morning, is that we are called to be part of God's family. The biblical word for that is fellowship. If you're taking notes this morning, write that down, fellowship. That word in the Greek is best translated, as we said before, koinonia, which means both fellowship and community combined together. And so many times we have fellowship in so many wonderful ways in this church. I love when you come in that you're warmly greeted. I love that our hospitality ministries just oozes hospitality in terms of providing snacks and, and, and times for dessert and discussion at our house. We have, um, in fact, someone asked me about that. Where do you get one of these mugs? <laughs> what you do is you sign up on the, on the table in the back and you come over to our home and when you have um, snacks with Deb and I, you get to leave home with a mug like this. And that's one of the things we try to do is to remind people that we're in fellowship with one another. But sometimes we can squabble in a fellowship because we're made of people. I watched a movie last night. Maybe some of you have seen My daughter's rented this for a birthday party called Mean Girls. Have any of you seen that? Other than a few um, things about it, uh, uh, sexual connotations, which I'm never very happy about, the premise of the movie is actually quite interesting. 
it had a, a group of young women that were in a clique. And the whole idea of this clique is they called them the plastics. The idea behind this plastics group was they were the in crowd. They were the ones that everybody looked at, kind of the Barbie doll image, if you will. And the truth is that they had this relationship, if you want to call it a fellowship, but it wasn't real. It was, it was just like that. They were plastic. They talked behind each other's backs. They gossiped about each other. In fact, they wrote all these things in a book, and they wrote in this book called the Burn Book, all the things that they didn't like about the other people in school. They had their pictures and all the nasty things they really thought about them. At the end of this movie, the Burn Book got out, and everybody in school saw the page that had their name and what these nasty girls wrote about them. You can imagine the chaos <laughs> that happened. People are screaming at each other. One teacher got accused of doing drugs. It was just nasty, and they were all fighting. And the principal got everybody together in a big room like this and said, you know what? We are not leaving until we clear up this mess. And in essence, he did the biblical thing. He said, our school's about unity. And if we keep gossiping about each other and back-talking about each other, we're never going to be in fellowship with one another. And one by one, they got up on stage and they confessed their faults. I thought, man, this is like a revival service. I want a testimony. Come on. They need a, a Christian producer in Hollywood to fix that movie. That would be great. But they did. They confessed their faults one to another, just as it says in, in, in the Bible. And then they forgave each other. They did this little ritual where they dropped and they fell backwards and they trust each other and caught each other. It was a wonderful experience of really what Christian unity should be about. There's a couple questions in your program this morning about fellowship. It says, one, what could I do to protect and promote unity in the church? In other words, if you ever heard anyone gossip about somebody in the church, what do you do to say, you know what, that's not right. We're a fellowship, and we don't talk about each other that way. And what are some of the common excuses that people give for not being a part of the fellowship? Maybe when you've been asked to be part of the, the team membership class, or you've, someone's asked, would you like to officially join the church? You go, oh, I can't, I'm too busy, or I don't want to do this, or I don't want to do that. What are some of the excuses that perhaps you've given? You see, we have new members. <laughs> Mary Lou's raising her hand right now. <laughs> would you like to share one? Go ahead. <laughs> you got it. Like, Woohoo! I think that's very common, Mary Lou's. That people say, "Well, I don't want to go to six weeks or eight weeks of class." Um, they have a, a morning one if you're interested. That's starting um, and you can go there from eight fifteen to nine forty-five, or they have a, a Thursday night one that. Um, Gordon Dual, our facilities director, is teaching. But really what that class is designed to do is to help you form family, to understand how it is a church we have our core values and our mission and our vision. Point number three I'd like to have you think about this morning is how we were created to become like Christ. If you remember the, the video clip we showed that day of Ron, he went to the driver's license change and he actually changed his name to Jesus Christ that day. And we said that's not what we're, this is all about. It's basically the biblical word is an understanding is to grow or to be taught. And that word is disciple. And we talk about discipleship being a key to the growth of you in terms of your Christian experience. And what you have to kind of think about is what would you like to be a year from now? What would you like to be 10 years from now? 30 years from now? Maybe 40, 50, 60 years from now? If you were to look back on your life, what would you like that to look like? Some of you notice these beautiful bouquets up in the front here. You see, on this very stage yesterday, or excuse me, Friday, we had a, a celebration of life, a funeral here. There are almost 400 people in this building celebrating the life of Bill Berg. Some of you knew Bill from when he visited our church. Most of you knew Mike Berg, our former worship director, and his dad who passed away. He fell out of a deer stand. And they came up on stage in testimony after testimony. They shared about his life. And I couldn't help but sitting there thinking about that. Of, they had a, a, a little thing in his brochure and a little pamphlet that they handed out about his testimony, how he was saved in 1971 and all the various things that he had done in the body of Christ and how he was a disciple of Jesus Christ. If people were to stand up here on this stage someday and share about your life, what would they share? What would they say about the, how you were Christ-like and how you lived your life? If your family was standing on the stage, what would they say about you, your work colleagues, your children, your parents? What would they say about you? 
What would you like them to say about you? Take a few seconds, jot a few things down in your program. If someone were to give a testimony about you, what would you want to be known for? Think about that. And how has God used certain things in your life to shape those characteristics about you? The fourth thing I'd like to share this morning is how we were shaped to serve God. Sometimes we forget that this biblical word for shaping, if you will, and service is ministry. And we challenge everyone at Crossroads Church to be part of some type of ministry, somewhere where they can connect. We talk about once you get connected through growing and closer to God, you're going to want to serve God by giving something back. When I was younger, I grew up in Waterville, Minnesota, a small little town, and I played on the T-ball league there. How many of you have ever been to a T-ball game or participated? Most people know what I'm talking about. It's kind of like baseball, <laughs> except the difference instead of having someone pitch is you have like this little T, it's a little rubber thing you put the ball on, and so the ball is stationary, and your job is to come up and smack it off the T and then r and run like you normally would in baseball. Well, I remember I was so excited. I took T-ball on for the first time in first grade, and it was actually quite something to actually get on base into T-ball because everybody's kind of crowded towards the front, <laughs> and the balls that hit very far, and it's, th it's a long ways to first base. So I remember I was so excited when I got up and I actually connected with the ball instead of the tee. The first five guys that hit me just kept hitting that tee over and over, but I actually hit the ball, and it happened to go right between some guy's legs. And I was so excited. I just kept going right into the outfield. And I'm running, I'm running. I got the first base, and I'm like, ooh, yeah! I hit the ball! I was so excited. And my coach is going, keep running, keep running, keep running. But I was like so caught up in the fact that I actually hit the ball that I stayed on first base. The ball keeps going into the outfield, and guys are chasing it, and they're running all over. And I'm staying at first base celebrating. Somehow I missed the purpose of baseball. You see, the purpose of baseball is not to get to first base. It's to go around and to get back home again. I learned that a little bit later. But so many of us are in that same place. We come to worship, because that's first base. Getting connected, beginning to experience the love of God. But then we kind of stay there. Woohoo! I'm part of a church. I'm on first base. I come here on Sundays. I get an hour in. I get fed. Yeah! Oh, what's that base over there? Oh, fellowship. Discipleship. I have to run to that one too? What's that all about? Join a small group? Well, I, I thought church was about first base right here. Oh, I got to go over to that base, fellowship, join a small group? Okay. Woohoo! I'm part of a small group. I get lots of cookies. This is great. Third base? What's that all about? Service? What's, what's that? You mean I, get, I have to do what? I have to give back? I have to give money to the church? What, what's that thing all about? What's that offering plate? Huh? You want me to like bring cookies on a Sunday morning and share with others? You want me to join a ministry team? Wow, that doesn't seem right. That should have been in a brochure somewhere. Well, what's that base all about? You mean you want me to do more than just help the church? You want me to help people outside the church? I, I got to come all the way to home? Yeah, that's what it's about, making a home run. It's not about getting to first base. You see, the last point this morning I want to share is something we talked about just the last two weeks. We've shared it about missions and evangelism, and that each of us were made for a mission. Each of us were made by God to hit a home run, not to celebrate on first base. And there's a biblical word for that is evangelism. And we talked about that two weeks ago, about being able to say a prayer with someone as simple as A, B, C, D. Let's see if you remember that. Quiz time. What's A stand for? Admit. We need to admit that we're sinners. What's B stand for? Believe. We need to believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins. C stands for what? Confess. We need to confess with our lips that Jesus Christ is the Lord of our life. And D stands for? Demonstrate. It's not enough to confess it and to say G that Jesus Christ is Lord. Even Satan said that. We have to believe it and live it. That's true evangelism. I don't know where you are in your faith walk. If you're just getting to first base and saying, you know what, this worship thing's all new for me. I, I'm just glad to be in the building. That's okay. You work on first base. You work on coming to worship on a regular time and place. Make that consistent for a while. But maybe you've been coming for a while and you've been sitting there, and like Mary Lou said, you've been like taking up some space but are afraid to take that next base. 
then I would challenge you to get in a small group, to begin fellowshipping with others and learning about God's word through discipleship. And maybe you've been doing that for a while, you've been fed, but you've never given back to serve. Maybe that's God's next step for you, is to get over to third base and begin serving or giving back to the body of Christ. I was so excited. I was here with a group of men and women serving yesterday who were taking care of all the wonderful trees and bushes that were taking place here. It was so exciting to see all these persons come together with all the various uh, power tool machinery going on, big trees moving in, bushes and shrubs being done. And meanwhile, there are people serving by putting on a shower down in the community room. There are others taking classes for network class to learn about their gifts for ministry. The youth group are out making sandwiches to help care for the poor. I was thinking, this is a service-oriented church. I love being a pastor here. I don't know what's going on half the time, but I love, I love showing up and seeing that other people know what's going on. That's good. It's a good thing God didn't put me in charge. Because this body is called to serve. And they have it in their DNA to help people. And if you're not on third base, I would challenge you to find a third base. And if you need to cut from first to third and run over the pitcher's mound, hey, that's cool. Go serve and then come back and do some small group stuff later. Whatever works for you. But serve. Because God made you that way. And the last thing is missions and evangelism, like I said. How will I communicate God's love to others? That's the challenge for us. Closing, I just want to share with you a story. I grew up on a farm. And this, this farm, when I first was a part of it, did not have indoor plumbing. Um, when I first saw this, the farmhouse that we moved into, it had the windmill and the pump, and inside we had to pump our water, actually in our kitchen. And of course, one of my dad's first things was to get indoor plumbing. We thought that would be a good thing. But I remember when he moved into the house, this was the fifth generation of our farm um, that some of the Marzans had moved into. And so before we got the indoor plumbing, we had this, this pump that was inside in the kitchen. And we used to have to, to pour water in it. And I've learned from the experience a lot of things. And when I saw this story that somebody else had shared with me, it just reminded me of those farm days when we used to have the hand pump. And the story when it was shared with me is about a man who comes to the, the desert, and he sees one of those kinds of hand pumps sitting there in the desert, and there's a big jug on it that says, pour in the pump to prime before you pump. And the guy that came to this was so thirsty because he'd been traveling through the desert, and he saw that gallon jug of water, and he thought to himself, you know, I'm just so thirsty. Maybe I should just drink some of that because I'm not sure if I pour it in, I'll ever get anything out. He never experienced what a pump was like. And so he looked at the water, he put it up to his lips and just thought to himself, well, someone wrote that note for a reason. I have to trust in it. So he takes the jug and he begins to pour it down the side of the pump. He begins to pump the handle. And the leathers begin to swell and this dry, rusty, sandy pump begin to squeak as he's pumping that. And he's pouring the jug down. And pretty soon, all the water was gone. But he kept pumping. He thought to himself, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I won't get out of this desert alive because the water's all gone. Maybe I should have drank it for myself. But he just kept pumping. He kept pumping. And pretty soon he began to hear the rush of the water coming from the bottom of the well. He began to feel the pressure in the handles. It got harder and harder to pump. And as he began to, to pump it harder and harder, the water began to trickle out. And it was kind of brown and mucky at first, but then it cleared out and it's crystal clean and clear and he took his jug and he filled it up again and he drank his fill so much so he could grab his canteens and the other jugs that were there and he, he filled them all up until the water was overflowing he poured some on his head and he refreshed his whole body and he kept pumping the water just poured everywhere he took out a pen and a piece of paper and he wrote on there please please don't forget to prime the pump you may not trust this piece of paper but I want you to know that unless you pour the water in, the next person behind you will not get any. Please, 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 pour this water down the pump so the person behind you can have living water. You're in this church today because somebody told you about Jesus. Somebody primed that pump in your life and they said, I'm going to pour the Holy Spirit into you and I'm going to pump and pump and pray and pray and you may not get it right away, but I'm going to keep pumping into this person and it was a grandmother, a Sunday school teacher, a pastor. Somebody pumped you up. You are here 
because somebody loved you. And now it's your turn. And for God's sake, you better start pumping. Because there's a chair right next to you that's empty. We just built a bigger parking lot. I want it full. Amen? And it's not going to get full unless you start pumping. You've got the tools. You've been taught. You've got God's word. And enough sitting there at first base. Get out and start pumping. Start leading people to Jesus. And start bringing people into the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I love you so much. And we are a church that's here for a purpose. We're not here to just play church. We're not here to just fellowship and eat cookies and enjoy each other's company. We're here to grow closer to you. We're here to serve the body of Christ in ministry. And we're here for the most important reason of all, to lead others into a relationship with you. So Lord, I pray this day that wherever anybody is at on that base walk, that they take that next step. That they find that next challenge in their faith walk. The most of all, Lord, I pray for people here to hit a home run. To not stand there and cheer at whatever base they're at, but to say, I need to get home until I've led someone to Jesus. I'm not a baseball player. Until I've led someone to Jesus Christ, I'm not even a Christian. Unless I leave this place where I know that I've led someone to Jesus through an ABCD prayer, I've not hit my home run. So Lord, I pray for each and every person in this room to experience what it's like to hit a home run. For each and every person in this room to know what it's like to have the exhilaration of knowing that because they prayed with somebody, that their friend is going to experience heaven for eternity. I pray that everybody here know your love so much that they can't help but want to share it with others. I pray for the celebration Sunday to be a celebration of new souls committed to you. I pray for all these things in your name. Amen. As a way of remembering, we're celebrating this morning communion. And this communion is a meal that Jesus Christ gave to us as a blessing. He gave it as the Last Supper, a demonstration of fellowship, of service, of servanthood. And when he was with his disciples, he took the cup and he poured it out for them and said, Take, drink. This is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you. And when he poured out the cup, he was doing so as a symbol of remembrance, of a way of telling them, before you shared this cup, you used to do this as a remembrance in terms of a slain lamb for atonement. But now as we share this cup, it has a new symbol, a new purpose, a new meaning. And that new meaning is one of the fact that I am going to die for you. I am the new blood of the covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. And that same night he took the bread broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. As often as you eat it, do this in remembrance of me. Whenever we eat of the bread or we drink of the cup, we do so in the remembrance of the mighty acts of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please repeat after me. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ Bless, O Lord, these gifts of bread and of juice. May they be for us the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May we share the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses. May we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into invite our communion stewards to come forward at this time and to receive communion, please. And as they come up, I'd like to explain a little bit of, about kind of the transition process.
did have the diagram on the screens. We're doing something a little different just to kind of help the flow a little bit. We're asking persons to kind of come through the outside aisles and then to come back through the center. And so if you're unfamiliar with our church, haven't done, can, haven't helped, um, just come through on the, on the side aisles and then back to the center. In the center, we're also gonna have communion. And this is um, for those that prefer rather to have intinction, we take the bread and dip it in the cup. This is for those that may have grown up in other traditions where we also have individual glasses for you. And if you prefer to take communion that way, you may do this so in the center station.
this time of receiving our offering, if you are a guest here today, please do not feel obligated to give. This is something we do at the body of Christ, that we give back to one another so that we may do the works of ministry. I would encourage everyone, however, to fill out our stewardship of attendance. You'll find just a little square piece on the bottom of your program, and especially if you're a guest, to fill that out and to put that in the offering plate with your email address so we can get our weekly devotion. Or if you have any prayer requests, we'd love to pray for you. I love to personally pray for you. So anything you'd like to write as a prayer request, we'd love to um, be in prayer with you. Also, during this time of offering, our altar is open, and we, um, if you have a request you'd like to share with us for healing, a request for salvation, whatever it is, feel free to come forward at this time. Let us now re receive our tithes and offerings. share with you a few brief announcements and then send us forth with God's love. The first announcement I'd like to make you aware of is the fact that even though we're having awesome food today, there's going to be some awesome food next Sunday as well. The group that's going to Mexico is celebrating by having a pancake breakfast for us. 
So there'll be pancakes, sausages, bacon, all those kinds of good things. You can come before church at 9.15 and eat before coming in. Or if you'd like to stay after worship next Sunday and celebrate by um, giving back to Mission Mexico, by staying after for pancakes, for a brunch or something, you may feel free to do so. Um, there will not be advanced sale tickets. We're just going to take a love offering, but we have a suggested donation of $5 per person or a family donation of $20. Uh, but you can give whatever you want. And if you just want to come and eat and you don't have the resources, feel free to do so as well. All the proceeds will be going to for scholarships um, for those youth and children that are going to Mission Mexico over Christmas break. So please um, give generously. We're leaving in just a few moments to have our celebration lunch, and we're going to do something a little different. And so we have all these fun diagrams. We want to explain how to get out of here and how to get back in. For those of you who have been part of our church for a while, we used to have a tradition every Sunday that when we finished worship, we stood up and we took our chairs and put them away. We're going to relive that, that tradition today. <laughs> it's not good to forget your roots, that's right. Some of these chairs click together, you may have noticed, so you'll have to be cautious not to wreck them, but we'd simply do, is we'd ask that when you leave today, that you unclick your little chair to pick it up, and there's a few extra chairs you may need to move as well, and take them to the side of the room. Be careful not to cover up any of the doors, since people will be using those. Uh, we'd ask then that you leave through one of the exit signs on my right or left. You'll be walking out to the lobby where you'll see a generous table full of food. And just like communion, you're going to come back down through the center. And so we're going to, by that time, hopefully have the tables back in here. And if you are feeling so inclined, you may work to that third base of service and stay and help move the tables from the table room in here if you'd like to do so. So we want to bless the food now so that people can feel free to eat as soon as um, um, they get out in the lobby um, and get their food. So let us pray. Dear Lord, we receive your blessing this day through worship, through celebrating, and remembering these five purposes. And Lord, we bless the food in the hands of your prayer. We bless our hospitality team for all their gifts of service. And Lord, we bless those that have donated the food this day. And Lord, we pray that you watch over this time of fellowship and celebration as we hear the comedian, as we celebrate the special music with Dave Hudson, as we watch video clips and hear testimonies. This is going to be an awesome, awesome meal like Jesus with those closest to him in that last supper, we are going to celebrate with those closest to us and remember your joy in our life. Be with us as we go forth this week to share the good news, to prime the pump for others and be with us as we fellowship in our celebration. We pray for these things in your name. Amen. celebration supper and don't forget the kids